Um, so I'm happy to be with you today virtually. I uh, apologize for not being able to be there in person. I am physically located over in Flagler County and I had a 10 o'clock meeting this morning and I have a 1.30 meeting this afternoon. So logistically, it wasn't gonna work for me to make the drive over there, but I'm happy to be able to do this presentation virtually and I appreciate your patience in dealing with the technology to make this happen. So let's go ahead and get started. So we want to talk about beyond the plastic bag, uh, basically reducing single-use plastic in everyday life. Well, I should tell you I am the Sea Grant Extension agent over in Northeast Florida, which means I'm a marine biologist and I'm very concerned about things that affect the ocean. And one of the things we know is that there is a lot of plastic that ends up in the ocean. One of the best databases we have for sort of those single use plastic items is the International Coastal Cleanup, which is coordinated by the Ocean Conservancy every year. Uh, and so every year you're probably familiar with the fact that um, around the second weekend of September, people go out to beaches and they pick up whatever trash they can find and they log the types of trash that they find and they submit all of those data. And the Ocean Conservancy compiles that all into an annual report. One of the things that's striking to me is that every year, more and more of the top 10 items that are found in that international coastal cleanup are plastic. Uh, three years ago, so the 2015 cleanup, the, uh, of the top 10 items, eight of them were made out of plastic. Then the next year, nine of them were made out of plastic. And then last year, 10, all 10 of the top 10 items were made out of plastic. Now, I'm not sure if you can read the uh, items that are listed on the right-hand side of your screen there, but from top to bottom, the top item is cigarette butts, then food wrappers, plastic beverage bottles, plastic bottle caps, plastic grocery bags, other plastic bags, straws and stirrers, plastic takeout or takeaway containers, plastic lids, and number 10 is foam takeout or takeaway containers. Uh, interestingly, it's the, the number eight item, the plastic takeout or takeaway containers that was new to the list in 2017. Um, we've had the 2018 International Coastal Cleanup this year, but those data will not be made available until about next summer. Um, but I can't believe that any of the top 10 items are going to go away. Uh, I, I suspect that this is going to be our top 10 list for a while. Um, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that, yes, cigarette butts are actually made out of plastic. It's usually plant-based plastic, but it is plastic nonetheless. And we know that we use an awful lot of plastic items that are what we phrase as single-use plastic. They're used one time and then they're disposed of. Overall, Globally, we know there are huge amounts of plastic that ultimately end up in the ocean. And a lot of this is due to mismanaged waste in mostly countries outside of the US. Um, we know that a lot of the Asian countries contribute a, a large proportion of this plastic that ends up in the ocean. But it, it's a staggering amount in 2010, it's estimated that 8 million metric tons of plastic entered the ocean. And by the year 2025, the scientists estimate that this number will have increased to 17 million metric tons in that one year. To help you visualize that, Dr. Jenna Jambeck, who is the primary author of this study cited here, uh, she says, imagine that for every foot of coastline, there are five grocery bags of plastic piled up on top of each other, every foot of coastline. So basically every time you take a step in a coastal area, there's five more grocery bags full of plastic. If we added that up for all of the 192 countries that were studied for this research project, that would be the amount that would be equal to 8 million metric tons of plastic. The five grocery bags of plastic for every foot of coastline for all of those 192 countries. That's pretty staggering. But what we don't see in the ocean is a large floating island of plastic, which is often described, but it is 
that description is not accurate. And one of the reasons that we don't have a large floating island of plastic is that these plastics all have different densities. And this graphic here is intended to show you where different types of plastic, different resins, would end up in typical seawater um, based on their density. So you can see that some of the things up at the top, we've got bottle caps, plastic bags, and polystyrene, that's expanded polystyrene, uh, so foam. Those are less dense than seawater. So those are gonna float right at the surface. And then we've got some things like other types of polystyrene, uh, nylon, cellulose acetate, that's that plant-based plastic that's used in cigarette filters that are slightly higher density than seawater, but under turbulent conditions would retain, would remain kind of suspended and also dependent on temperature of the water. Um, they'd remain suspended in the water column somewhere between the surface and the seafloor. Then we have the very high density plastics, things like PVC, um, believe it or not, polyester, and PET, which is the type of plastic that we make most of our beverage bottles out of, uh, those all have very high densities, and so they are expected to sink to the bottom relatively quickly. One of the reasons that we're very concerned about the plastic that's ending up in the ocean is that it's going to be there for a very long time. And this is true for plastic in, in any environment, not just in the ocean. Um, so apart from the very small amount that has been incinerated, basically every piece of plastic ever made still exists because plastic does not biodegrade in a reasonable time frame. Usually when we talk about something being biodegradable, the expectation is that it will revert back to its harmless elemental composition. So things like carbon dioxide, water, oxygen, within a matter of months, generally less than a year, some people say less than six months, is the time frame for something to be considered biodegradable. Plastics definitely do not biodegrade in that time frame. And so we know that we're making more and more plastic items every year, and those plastic items are not disappearing. They're not going anywhere. But often what they are doing is breaking down into smaller pieces over time. So we often refer to plastic as degrading, meaning it breaks into smaller bits, but not biodegrading, meaning it doesn't degrade into the elemental harmless form. So these smaller and smaller pieces, if they get to be less than five millimeters in size, we call them microplastics. So that's a term that you may have heard. It's um, become kind of a, a hot button topic in the recent few years. Um, and really all it means is bits of plastic that are less than five millimeters. If those plastic items started off as something bigger and then degraded into that smaller size, we call them secondary microplastics. So you can see these, these fragments here. Um, secondary microplastics also include little fibers that generally come from textiles, things like our clothing and carpets and upholstery, um, tarpaulins, ropes. These synthetic fibers um, from things like nylon, polypropylene, polyester, acrylic, uh, they're known to shed from those different textiles. It was originally thought that primarily this happened through the laundering process, but it's now known that drying washed items also might actually release more fibers than the washing process. And just general wear and tear uh, probably releases a lot of these fibers and they will ultimately end up in the air and get carried all around the globe, basically. Now, I said those were secondary microplastics. We do have plastic items that we deliberately make as small pieces. 
Uh, these include Nurdles, which, apart from just being kind of a fun name, um, is the way that we ship pre-consumer plastic. So if I were a plastic manufacturer and I wanted to acquire you know, 10 tons of polypropylene to turn into bottle caps, I'm going to get container loads of these little plastic pellets. They'll all be polypropylene pellets and I'll be able to melt them down, add whatever dyes I want to add to them, do whatever, mold them in whatever way I want to mold them uh, and produce my plastic product. Because this is the way we transport those pre-consumer plastics, uh, that means we have container loads of these getting shipped across oceans. We have spills that happen. We have rogue waves that hit ships but we also have spillage that occurs in the transferring process from location A to location B, uh, whether it's from a, a warehouse into a container, what have you. And ultimately we do end up with a lot of these out in the environment and particularly out in the ocean. A perhaps better known type of primary microplastic is the notorious microbead. Uh, these are even smaller than the nurdles. Uh, these are the things that were included in facial scrubs and toothpastes and got a lot of bad press a couple of years ago. Um, they are still included in some personal care products, including a lot of deodorants, which may be a bit surprising to people. We The, the best explanation that I have as to why we would have plastic in deodorants is that it is an inexpensive filler. And I think that that is the primary reason that it is found in so many uh, deodorants and, and some other personal care products, some body lotions, a lot of makeup products, mascara, glittery blush or eyeshadow, um, the glittery component is probably from plastic. So how do you know if your personal care product contains plastic? you're going to want to look for the word polyethylene. That's the thing that is circled here um, on the product label. And polyethylene is the type of plastic that is most commonly used in personal care products. So if you see that on the label, it means that there is plastic inside that product. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, didn't we have a law that was passed a couple of years ago to restrict microbeads from personal care products? And yes, we did. In 2015, the Microbead Free Waters Act was signed and it was phased in um, over the last three years. Uh, the final phase took effect July 1st of this year. But what that act, what that piece of legislation does is it prohibits the inclusion of microbeads in certain personal care products. So these are defined as rinse off cosmetics that are designed to exfoliate or cleanse the human body or parts thereof. So this does cover those facial scrubs. It does actually explicitly include toothpastes. So they are, they are mentioned by type. Um, but what it does not do is include things like lotions and makeup and deodorants uh, because by definition, they are not rinse off cosmetics designed to exfoliate or cleanse the human body. It also does not include hollow microbeads. It only includes solid plastic beads. So that's just another interesting little loophole that is being taken advantage of by some products. So just be aware of those limitations of this act. Don't assume that anything you buy uh, in the the personal care products section of the store uh, will be plastic free. Okay, so what's the big deal? Why am I here rambling on to you about microplastics? We know that there are lots of them in the environment. Everywhere they've been looked for in the environment, they've been found. They're found in soil, they're found in fresh water, they're found in ocean water, they're found in beach sand, they're found in remote mountain lakes, they're found in marine life. Uh, the guts of different organisms uh, that have been searched for microplastics. In most cases, scientists are finding microplastics in the guts of different marine organisms. 
and we know that they never go away. So they're going to be around for a very long time and they're increasing in abundance out in the environment. There's a lot that we don't know. There's probably been more that we don't know about microplastics than we do know. Um, this is a very new field of research. It's really been in the last 10 years and more focused in the last five years uh, that people have started investigating microplastics and, and trying to do research studies. I imagine in the next 20 to 25 years, we will know a whole lot more about microplastics and their impacts in the environment than we know now. Um, but people are working on a lot of these questions. Of course, the big elephant in the room, the one that everybody would love to know the answer to is, is there any potential impact on people? And we'll touch on that. So what we do know is that plastics in the ocean, um, or just plastics in general, contain chemicals or can contain chemicals that potentially are can have an impact on both marine organisms but but any animals uh, including people and these include things like bisphenol a that you're probably familiar with uh, you may have recognized that water bottles and plastic plates and any food or beverage contacting plastic item is generally now labeled as BPA free because that bisphenol A was determined to be a potential endocrine disruptor, which means it could have impacts on developing embryos, developing um, young minds, as well as, as physical parts of, of development of, of an organism. Um, and so it was determined that that was not a good thing to have in plastics that are in contact with food. What they found was that in uh, human baby bottles, the, the formula or the milk in the baby bottles was found to have BPA in it that was leaching from the plastic into the liquid. There are other things that we use in manufacturing plastic, other chemicals. Um, a group of plasticizers called phthalates is a, another suspected endocrine disruptor as are some of the flame retardants that are added to certain plastic items. So all of these chemicals that are found within the plastic, we know that they can leach out of the plastic and get into organisms. And some researchers did a study in the Mediterranean where they took uh, stranded fin whales, they had access to carcasses of five different stranded fin whales. And the most common thing that's done with stranded whales is scientists collect blubber samples because blubber, just like fatty tissue in, in humans, is where a lot of toxins will accumulate. And they came up with the idea to look for phthalates in these whales' blubber. And they did find phthalates in the blubber. The phthalates did match some of the phthalates that they found in plankton samples in the Mediterranean. Uh, so that's a pretty good indication that phthalates are getting from plastics into plankton and perhaps directly from plastics into whales, uh, but these happen to be filter feeding whales, so they are definitely feeding on plankton, um, and those chemicals were ending up in their blubber. What impact that had on the animals, we don't know, but it's kind of the first step in investigating uh, potential impacts. Another way that plastics can transport toxins into animals is in the ocean in particular, there are a lot of toxic chemicals. We refer to them as persistent organic pollutants. Persistent because they stick around for a while, organic because they're carbon-based, and pollutants because they're considered undesirable things in that environment. These include things like the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the PCBs, the DDT family of pesticides. And all of these POPs have one thing in common, and that is they are hydrophobic. They don't really like being in water. They are much happier being in something that is oil-based. And of course, our plastics are, for the most part, petroleum-based. And structurally, they are desirable to these toxic chemicals. And so these chemicals will adsorb, they'll stick to the surface of 
pieces of plastic that are floating around in the ocean. And they'll actually accumulate on the surface. One study found uh, that a certain group of toxins was a million times more concentrated on the surface of pieces of plastic than it was in the ambient seawater. We also know that if animals then eat those pieces of plastic, those toxins will disassociate from the plastic and will end up in the tissues of the animals. Again, we're not really sure what impact that has. We don't really know if it is a significant contribution to accumulation of toxins in these organisms, which are swimming around in that water all the time anyway. So they're chronically being exposed to low levels of these toxins we don't have a good feel for whether consuming plastics adds significantly to the, the pollutant load in these organisms or not, but it's another area of research that people are investigating. There have been very few studies that have shown actual impacts of consuming plastic on, on any type of organism. There have been several that have been done with marine organisms. Um, a very well done study was one using Pacific oysters. They had tanks of oysters that just had regular seawater and were fed plankton. And then they had tanks where in addition to the regular seawater and the plankton, they added microscopic polystyrene plastic beads. Um, and these oysters are filter feeders, so they're going to filter stuff out of the water and pass it through their digestive tracts, and then they're going to expel waste as uh, pseudofeces. What they looked at was the reproductive output of these oysters. So they measured egg production, sperm motility, larval survival, and growth. And what they found was across the board in all of those measures, the oysters that were eating plastics were worse off than the controls, than their, their non-plastic eating counterparts. What they didn't investigate was the mechanism by which this result happened. So they didn't do, uh, they didn't investigate in the tissues for toxins or do an energy kind of uh, measurement. So there have been different hypotheses that have been proposed to explain the this result. One is that, well, maybe it just costs more energy to get these plastic beads through the digestive tract and get them expelled. And maybe that means the oysters couldn't put as much energy into rep reproduction um, compared to the controls. The other possibility is, you know, maybe we were seeing some sort of effect of these endocrine disrupting hormones or compounds. Um, that's going to remain a question until somebody does a study that is actually designed to measure that, those pathways. Um, a couple of other studies that I've got listed there, again, show negative impacts of either consuming plastic or even just exposure to water in which plastics had been um, sitting for a period of time. Um, so those, the, the one where the brown mussel larvae study, um, what they did was they soaked plastic pellets in the water and then they removed the plastic pellets and then they added fertilized uh, embryos into the water and looked at their development. And in that case, it looks pretty strongly like it must be a chemical uh, impact. But again, those, the tests were not done on the tissues to, to try and detect. Of course, we're dealing with microscopic little larvae here, so it may not even be a feasible thing to do. So as with most scientific studies, these have raised more questions than they've answered, but we're making baby steps on coming up with answers. Okay, so I said that the elephant in the room is, what about people? Well, we know that microplastics are found in a lot of things that people eat. Um, one of the first studies published making this connection was looking at table salts, uh, different salts produced in different parts of China. And they found, yes, there were microplastics in table salt. And then Chelsea Rockman with her PhD, uh, her dissertation work, she looked at seafood 
and specifically looked at seafood that was available in markets in California and in Indonesia. This included both fish and uh, oysters, at least uh, in the California market. And what they did was they purchased whatever whole animals they could find and then analyzed their guts for looking for microplastics. And again, in most cases, they found microplastics. And a lot of subsequent studies have done the same, either looking at food fish or looking at fish in different parts of the water column, um, looking at crabs, looking at oysters, looking at clams. And again, for the most part, they're finding microplastics in the digestive tracts of these animals. And then the most recent study that um, came to light, uh, this just came out last month. It was presented at a gastroenterology conference where researchers got eight volunteers to keep a food diary for a month and then submit fecal samples. And the researchers analyzed those fecal samples for microplastics. And sure enough, they found microplastics in human waste. So, the question of whether or not people are eating microplastics is very strongly um, suggested to be answered by this study. Um, all 100% of the stool samples contain microplastics. They actually had nine different types of microplastics in total um, in these samples. And so then the question still comes up, well, how are people eating plastic. You know, we mentioned the seafood, we mentioned this sea salt, um, but even people that don't eat seafood, and I should mention that most kinds of seafood, things like fish, um, we're not actually eating the digestive system of those animals. We do with some of the shellfish, but for the most part, we're eating muscle and, and not the digestive system. But other studies have found that microplastics are also in a lot of liquids, uh, tap water, bottled water, beer, uh, as well as these other things we've already mentioned. And it was interesting because the, it was Dr. Sherry Mason at, in New York who did the bottled water study and has done some of the tap water and beer studies as well. Um, what they found with the bottled water studies was that the most common type of microplastic they were finding in the bottled water was blue polypropylene. And if you look at the picture of the water bottle here, you notice that it has a blue cap on it. And I can tell you that cap is made out of polypropylene plastic. So their presumption is that the, some of the plastics that are ending up, that they're finding in these bottled water samples are actually coming from the bottling process itself. The same question comes up with tap water. I actually asked Dr. Mason um, when they released a, a tap water study that one of her graduate students was involved with, whether she thought that the water was getting the microplastics during the, the process of being filtered and purified and what have you, or whether it was getting into the water between the tap and the vessel that you were collecting the water in. And, and she agreed that it could very well be the latter um, because we know that microplastics are in the air, as I've mentioned. Um, if you're running water through air into a glass or a container of some sort, it could well be picking up microplastics during that time uh, as opposed to picking them up in the pipes on the way to wherever you are. So it didn't surprise me when that study came out about the microplastics being found in human waste. Um, that seems pretty logical to me. Um, so all of this kind of scary stuff leads up to the purpose of today's talk, which is really to show you, talk to you about ways that we can, as a society, but also as, as individuals, reduce the amount of plastics that we throw away, so the amount of plastic waste that we generate. And we really focus in this effort on single-use plastics. So 
I am often asked how I can stay optimistic because I often convey a lot of doom and gloom to people and I get people depressed. Um, but I really am optimistic about this subject. I personally have made a lot of changes in what I do in the last three to five years and have seen a huge decrease in the amount of waste that I am generating. And I'm just one person and I have taught thousands of people. And if each of them just does one fraction of what I've done, I feel like I'm making a difference and we are all individually making a difference. So I list here kind of the four R's, um, the old reduce, reuse, recycle has now been jo joined in many people's minds by a fourth refuse, um, which a lot of people will actually list first in, in the list of four. Um, and I probably would prioritize it as being the, the most important in there. Um, recycling is often touted as something that people could do and should do more of. You may have heard statistics saying that only 9% of the plastics that are produced uh, are recycled. Uh, we have statewide and national goals for recycling plastic and in Florida in general, we are not getting anywhere close to those recycling goals. Uh, but there are a lot of limitations or a lot of challenges with recycling. Um, people need to, to understand what their local recycling company will accept and will not accept. And they need to be very careful about what they put in their curbside recycling, be aware that there are certain items that they can only and should take back to stores that have collection bins for those items. Things like plastic bags, uh, polystyrene foam trays are accepted at some grocery store locations. Um, those items should never be put in your curbside bin because they cannot deal with them. Um, in the case of plastic bags, they will tangle up the sorting equipment and it causes all sorts of problems, could end up in a whole load of stuff that's been collected for recycling actually just being dumped and ending up in a landfill. Um, so improper recycling can actually be worse than not recycling at all. And bottom line, there's not a huge market for recyclable plastic. So that means that we can have our, our you know, agencies can collect as much as they want, but if nobody wants to buy it, it's still potentially going to end up in the landfill. So a much better option is to reduce the amount of waste that we generate in the first place. Um, I threw the other couple of things in here, the labels on personal care products, obviously that looking for that polyethylene word and avoiding that if you want to avoid having plastic in those products. And I also, I'm in a coastal area, so I encourage people to participate in beach cleanups, but I would expand that to be any sort of cleanup because ultimately anything that's on the ground can end up in the stormwater system and can end up in freshwater or marine water bodies. Um, so the more we can pick up and prevent from ending up back out in the environment, the better. Now there is some confusion about some plastic products. There are a lot of products that are now being made from plant materials. I mentioned the cellulose acetate that is in the cigarette butts. Um, that's been around for a long time. There are some newer plant-based plastics that are being promoted as being more environmentally friendly, uh, greener, compostable, biodegradable. These are generally made from corn, some are made from potatoes, some are made from you know, other plant waste products. Um, and ultimately, chemically, what they're made out of is something called polylactic acid or PLA. They may or may not be labeled as PLA plastic. Um, they may legitimately be labeled as compostable or biodegradable. Uh, there are standards that products, if they meet those standards, they can claim to be biodegradable or compostable. Um, but those standards are based on how the product behaves in an industrial composting facility. The difference between an industrial composting facility 
and a home composting pile is temperature. So industrial composters uh, heat products up to 120 degrees. They also make sure that there's water and oxygen uh, that is added. And it still takes these products about three months to degrade in those conditions. So technically they are biodegradable or compostable, but here in Florida, we don't have access to those industrial composting facilities. So here, they're actually no better in the environment uh, than a petroleum-based plastic. And they are going to behave exactly the same way in the environment in terms of um, adsorbing those persistent organic pollutants on their surfaces, um, as well as just the, the length of time that they will stick around, which we don't really know for sure, but it's probably decades to hundreds of years. Again, depending on the environmental conditions that they end up in. So you see here my last bullet says a PLA bottle in the ocean is expected to degrade in six to 24 months. Um, but if it's buried in sediments where there is no oxygen, if it's in very cold temperatures, you know, there are all sorts of environmental factors that are going to affect that degradation rate. So what can we do? There are lots and lots of things that we can do. Um, and I'm not sure if you have any of these things in the room with you, but I have some here at my desk. And when I get done with the PowerPoint, I'll, I'll go ahead and hold some of them up. Um, there are things that I carry around in my car so that I never have an excuse of not having it with me. One item that I have in my car is a, a cup very much like the one on the, the top left here. Um, but mine actually has a washable straw in it. So I have a washable cup with a washable straw. That way, if I go out to a restaurant, I don't have to use a disposable cup to have my beverage in. I can bring in my own. I have not yet run into a situation where somebody refused to allow me to use my own cup. Um, and then I just take it with me and I wash it. In my office, I've tried to get folks to avoid using styrofoam products and plastic stirrers. And instead, we have ceramic reusable cups, we have washable spoons. Um, so we're trying to, to do more and more of that. Again, just reducing the amount of waste. Yeah, somebody's got to wash the dishes, but we have to wash our dishes at home anyway. Shopping bags, you know, switching from the single use grocery bag to canvas or other reusable tote bags. You know, that's not a new concept. That's a something that's been being done for a long time. Um, but I'm still surprised how few people actually bring their own bags to the grocery store. And that's another thing that they just end up living in my car. And so I don't have the excuse. I have walked early on. I walked into the grocery store without my bags. And the way I got myself trained to remember my bags was I asked the bagger, don't bother bagging these, just put them back in my cart. And I will bag them myself when I get to my car in my reusable bags, which I left in my car. So it didn't take very long before I remembered to take my reusable bags in with me. Um, drinking straws in the lower left, that's uh, another, I refer to it as the new microbead um, because years ago there was a big push to uh, do away with the microbeads and that did ultimately end up in that Microbead Free Waters Act. Currently, the trend seems to be encouraging businesses to not use single-use plastic straws, to either switch to paper, to offer straws only on request, or both. Um, and that, that has received quite a bit of traction, especially in, in coastal areas. We know with the International Coastal Cleanup, they find a lot of straws out on the beach in front of beachfront restaurants. Um, so that's provided motivation for a lot of beachfront restaurants to try and be a little bit more environmentally friendly. And I totally understand that many people need to drink through straws. And that's fine. We have all sorts of reusable washable straws available. Stainless steel, glass, even plastic, but thicker plastic, they're washable. And there are straw cleaning brushes that are like, I think of them as teeny tiny test tube brushes. Um, that you can use to clean the inside of the straws. A somewhat more challenging uh, option is 
related to textiles. I mentioned the synthetic fabrics shedding fibers. Natural fabrics shed fibers as well. Um, but when possible, we try and encourage people to choose natural fabrics rather than synthetics, just because the fibers that are shed from the natural fabrics will degrade more rapidly than the synthetic fibers do. Um, we don't yet have any research showing a comparison um, between natural fibers and synthetic fibers when it comes to how, how they affect organisms. Um, but I know that there was a graduate student in Dr. Chelsea Rockman's lab who is uh, currently working on some research along those lines. So I'm curious to see what she ends up finding. So going back to the, the fibers, and remember I said that initially at least, the, the big emphasis has been on how can we reduce fiber shedding when we wash clothing. And so there are some things that have been tried. Um, some of these are fairly new products. They, two of them, the Cora Ball on the right and the Guppy Friend on the left are things that you use inside your washing machine. The Guppy Friend is a, a zippered bag that you put your clothing into and then you wash the clothing in the bag in the washing machine and fibers are trapped in the seams of the bag. The Cora Ball also goes in your washing machine and fibers are trapped around the, the synthetic rubber um, little finger-like projections there. The Filtrol 160 and the Lint Lover in the center, those are external filters that you hook your drain pipe to from your washing machine and they, the, the water flows through a filter um, and the mesh there traps fibers. All of these are, are available. None of them really have good data showing how effective they are. And one of the reasons for that is the effectiveness depends on the type of fabric, the age of the fabric, whether or not you use laundry soap, whether or not you use fabric softener, whether you use liquid soap versus powdered soap, all of these things affect how, how efficient these different products are. So we don't have a standardized method for testing them. Um, you know, it's probably a situation of something is better than nothing, um, but nothing is a silver bullet here either. So I'm gonna take my last couple of minutes here just to explain something that I've been doing for the last several years, um, and that is the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project. When I started educating people about marine debris, um, and when word started getting out about this great Pacific garbage patch, this thing that is not a floating island, but that is a lot of microplastic in the water, um, people were asking me, you know, well, what's the situation in Florida? You know, how much plastic, is there plastic in our water? Is there plastic in my backyard? You know, do we know who's, who's studying that? And the answer was, well, nobody was really studying it. So I came up with the idea to start a citizen science project. So we're now um, starting our fourth year of the Florida Microplastic Awareness Project. And we recruit volunteers to collect one liter water samples, bring them into one of our locations. They filter the samples through a, a small filter. It's got very small pore size. It's 0.45 micrometer pore size. A micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter. Um, so this is basically the size of filter that's used to collect and count bacteria on. I chose these filters not because I needed something quite that small, but because they have this nice grid pattern on them that you may or may not be able to see up on the screen. But trust me, they have essentially graph paper printed on the filter. And that makes it really easy when you're looking at that filter through a microscope to make sure that you're not double counting anything and you're not missing anything because you can just kind of scroll across and down and back and down and across and down and so on until you've viewed the whole filter. And what they're looking for on these filters are little tiny pieces of plastic. Now if you look at the lower left hand picture there you can see part of that grid. The, those dark lines um, are some of those grid squares on that filter paper and the grid is roughly three millimeters by three millimeters. So that'll give you an idea of, of the 
size of these pieces that we're finding. They are truly microscopic. We generally cannot see them with the naked eye. And yet they are plastic and they are in the water. And we sort them into four different groups. This is based on some of the oceanographic studies that have been done and the way they have classified plastics. So we have the fibers, which is what you see in the lower right, that blue, um, very round, very uniform diameter uh, piece that is a, a synthetic fiber. Up above it is what we would classify as a fragment. It's not uniform in diameter. It's more likely a, a shard that has broken off of a larger plastic item. You can maybe make out that it's frayed at the kind of the pointed tip part. Uh, so we would call that a fragment. The microbead is the item in the center at the bottom um, and it is very spherical is very small and they are generally colored. We have seen very, very few microbeads. In fact, of all the samples that I have looked at myself, I have not seen a single microbead. That picture came to me courtesy of one of my volunteers. Um, and then the fourth class that we, we use is film. So this is things like plastic wrap, plastic bags, those thin, very flexible, it's usually um, polyethylene, either high density or low density polyethylene, so the recycle numbers two or four um, items. So those are the four ways that we, we classify the plastics. And what we're finding is that, yes, there are plastics in the water. Not every liter of water has plastic in it. The majority of the samples do. On average, you know, we probably have something like between one and three pieces of plastic per liter. Um, but some samples will be weighted much more heavily. Uh, they'll contain much more plastic and others, as I said, will contain none. Um, but the interesting thing is that by having volunteers do this and find plastic in water that in many cases has literally come from their backyards, um, people are a lot more concerned about plastic in the environment. So the other part of the Microplastic Awareness Project is educating people and getting people to change their behavior, reduce their use of single-use plastic. So we have a pledge, which I think Julie may have printed out and have copies available for you there. Uh, but if she doesn't, you can go online to our website, which is plasticaware.org. And we have it in numerous locations on that website. There's a, a link that you can click on. There's a QR code here on your screen you can go directly to bit.ly slash plastic pledge and that will take you straight to the pledge and you can take the pledge online. And on this pledge, we have eight simple actions that we ask people to consider doing. And I've mentioned a couple of these already. Um, looking down the list, we've mentioned bringing your own cold drink cup. I'll add their, your own hot drink cup as well. When I travel, I take a a travel mug with me. I also take a water bottle with me. And uh, I also take something that looks a bit like a, one of the old mess kits. It's a, a stainless steel container with a lid that latches onto it. And I'll use that in the hotel if it's got a you know, breakfast buffet. Those are generally, uh, they usually have styrofoam or plastic plates and bowls and things for you to use. I can use my, my own washable container. I also travel with a washable spork, a stainless steel spork. So that covers spoon and fork. And then I do have a small pocket knife that I take with me as well. So I don't have to use those plastic utensils um, or those plastic plates or cups or bowls. Um, and it also works as a to-go container if I go to a restaurant and have leftovers, that same stainless steel mess kit. I can use to take my leftovers home. Um, we've mentioned recycling and some of the limitations there. We certainly do encourage people to recycle things properly. Um, and then we've talked about the fabric. So all of these things are, are on the pledge. And we recognize that people, you may already be doing some of these things and that is an option when you take the pledge to indicate what you're already doing. But we'd also like you to, to think about what you might be willing to do. And so we've been, We've had this pledge for about three years now. Uh, we've had almost 2,000, actually we've had a little more than that collected now. Um, I'll be updating these data next month. Every three months I, I go through and update them. 
we do ask people if they're willing to provide their email address and if they they do provide that then we follow up with them to find out what actions they've actually taken and it's been really rewarding to me to discover that people are not only saying that they're willing to make changes but reporting that they actually have made several changes uh, in what they're doing and so that's all great and hopefully it's all ending up resulting in less plastic ending up in the environment or just even in the landfill, just less waste having to be disposed of. We do have a Facebook group and a Facebook page. So if you are on Facebook, you're welcome to join us there. Um, and with that, I'm going to end with my contact information. If anybody wants it, I'd encourage you to take a picture of the screen because I'm going to go ahead and jump out of this mode so that I can see you and can answer any questions that you might have and I'll also show you the